Kicking off our list at number 10, dental surgery. Back in the ancient Egyptian worlds, it's not like you could just take a quick trip to the dentist to get your teeth checked out and cleaned, yada yada, and then you go home, whatever, right? The diet of the average Egyptian was most definitely not exactly, you know, conductive to having an impeccable set of pearly whites. That's mostly due to the fact that the tools used to grind food would often leave traces of sand and or stone behind, which, you know, would naturally destroy your chiclets. And through documents found, there have been a few different dental treatments from that time that have been discovered. And it's pretty horrifying, like topical treatments and such. But one case was able to give us a glimpse into what is believed to be the treatment of an abscess, an ancient abscess. We love those. Even more interesting is a mummy that was found from the fourth dynasty. This mummy, in his first molar, was a bunch of surgically produced holes that they believe were used to drain an abscess, which clearly gives us some, you know, very tangible evidence that dental surgeries were in fact happening all those years ago. And before we head into the rest of this list, we also have to remember that all this was done, or most of this was done, without anesthetics, right? No one's gonna put you to sleep, and then you wake up and you're like, ah, oh, my teeth are gone, what happened? No, you were awake for the whole thing. It sucked. Number nine, Egyptian stitches. Yeah, gotta talk about Egyptians once again. I'm gonna talk about them quite a bit. They're the OGs. Just in general, while surgery did exist during ancient Egyptian times, invasive surgery wasn't quite as common because, well, obviously, like I just said, no painkillers, no antibiotics, the list goes on, right? No fun. One thing that's less invasive, but still extremely important, was seen quite a bit during these times. Use of stitches. Yeah, I've never needed any in my life, thank God, knock on knock on wood that I don't need any stitches. Ancient Egyptians found different and effective ways to make their own sutures in order to close these large wounds. They did so by using plant fibers or hair or tendons or wool threads, anything, right? In the oldest known surgical text, which is referred to now as the Edwin Smith Papyrus that came from ancient Egypt, there are 48 different cases of stitches being described. 48, imagine being one of those 48, that's Kind of epic, not gonna lie. Number eight, blood transfusion. Back around 70 AD, the Romans were pretty wild when it came to the Colosseum and the games that would go on inside. There was, uh, yeah, a lot of bloodshed and crowds would rush the arena after the day was done. Not to get autographs, but to hopefully, hopefully get a sip of that sweet gladiator blood. Yeah, blood back then was a magical elixir. And then near the early 1500s, blood was seen as this youth juice. Yeah, you drink some young blood as an elderly, and then those knees, your patellas, would apparently start working again. A lot of theories surrounding blood back then. And in the Middle Ages, bloodletting was a go-to when you were sick because they thought your humors were out of balance. It is so hot in this goddamn In 1628, blood circulation was discovered by a man named William Harvey. That changed the game, right? Now, the idea of something going into your bloodstream was in the picture hypothetically. That's a little odd. So we started to test this out on canines. Scientists were injecting them with different substances, and slowly but surely, that turned into blood transfusion between animals, between canines. So this is back in the 1660s, right? That's how early we started injecting things with blood. It's kind of gross. Number seven, cataract surgery. Okay, don't tell him I told you this, but Kyle, my brother Kyle, our other lovely co-host on B, is blind in one eye. Yep. Kyle was born with a cataract, but you would never know because he plays rugby amazingly and somehow he reads this tiny prompter. I can barely do it with two eyes. No idea how you do it, man, you're a champ. Cataract surgery is one of the oldest surgeries in the book, well, rather in the painting. It was found in a tomb in ancient Egypt. It was a painting of what is surely the oldest recorded eye surgery. Scientists are able to make this conclusion due to the length of the tool that the doctor is holding. They believed this was a method called couching, which happened to be recorded. See, the needle would push the cloudy lens to the bottom of the eye, ideally fixing their vision. The oldest tools found in Egypt tell us that 4,000 years ago, this was the first time it had been done. But afterwards, evidence of couching was found all over the world. Now, it wasn't until 1747 until Jacques Daniel, a doctor in France, he performed the first ever cataract extraction surgery in a modern sense. He was the OG. Every method sounds wildly uncomfortable. Have you been through this? Like Kyle has kudos. Number six, skin treatment. As soon as summer comes around, honestly, it's game over. I burn so easily. That's why I'm a fan of winter, right? I don't have to keep applying sunscreen to my face all day and feel like I'm about to faint. But how did ancient Egyptians beat the heat back in ancient times? They didn't have banana breeze SPF 35. No, ancient Egyptians valued their skin as a symbol of beauty. Yeah, you think your morning skin routine requires a lot of work? Buddy, read a book. Their routine was written on a tomb written on tomb walls and scrolls. They used rice bran containing UV absorbing gamma original. Yeah, that was used to block the sun off. Jasmine as well helped repair sun damage. Ancient Greeks would use olive oil as sunscreen, which as far as UV protection goes, it did absolutely nothing. You're burnt and dehydrated, but also you look good, okay? Tan lines, I see you. Number five, cancer treatment. 
All right, the big C. Cancer is something that obviously very is you know very prevalent in our modern society, and because of the rising rates, it makes us ask ourselves: Did cancer exist in ancient times? If so, where was it recorded? While they didn't call it cancer, it definitely did. Some of the earliest evidence of cancer is found in ancient manuscripts. Mummies, fossilized bone tumors that have been found in ancient Egypt specifically. There are tons of examples and different forms of cancer that have been found throughout. Perhaps the oldest comes from 3000 BC. And it was found, like I said, in the Edwin Smith papyrus that we talked about before. Now in this text, it describes eight cases of tumors or ulcers of the breast and how they treated them back then, or at least tried to. See, back then these tumors were removed by cauterization using a tool called a fire drill. Other than this though, the text says in reference to the illness that there is no treatment. So in ancient times and today, we're still trying to figure this one out. Number four, tooth extraction. You may not think of surgery when you talk about tooth extraction, but this for sure counts as surgery. This, yeah, I've had a tooth pulled. It's pretty, it's pretty intense. Every time something gets removed from your body, I'm gonna count that. And if there's definitely blood involved, yeah, I'm gonna count that. Getting a tooth pulled is still so barbaric. Even today, they don't like slice a line and then gently slide the tooth out or anything surgical. No, they just have two dentists grab your tooth at the same time, put their foot up, and then yank it out. I was numb, sure, but it was still weird, okay? Back in the day, pulling teeth was done not to make room for braces, but to solve any problem, or well, all problems, regarding your teeth. Yeah, cavity, gone. Toothache, bleh, see ya. Oh, some plaque, no problem. <laughs> Today, we're lucky to have x-rays and modern technology, you know, to tell us if a, a tooth is coming in sideways or which ways. But back then, some believed that it was tooth worms. Yeah, this feeling over here could be a worm. Go get it checked out. Could have worms in your head. Gross. Aristotle and Hippocrates wrote about dentistry around 500 BC, and the way they would handle tooth decay or extraction was by using metal wires to fix wobbly teeth or even a broken jaw aka ancient braces. Number three, trepanation. One of history's oldest surgeries. Trepanation was also, it was, it was the worst, it was horrible. To this day, we're not even sure why this was a thing, but we picked up a few ideas along the way. Let's talk about it. Turning the clocks back to thousands of years ago, trepanation was the practice of drilling holes into your skull. A popular theory is that trepanation was done to release evil spirits. Yeah, let's drill some holes in our skull and see if our mental illness just goes away. That'll help. As barbaric as this sounds, skulls found in Peru hint that this procedure wasn't as fatal as you'd first guess. The reason this would happen was also to clear out bone fragments after skull fractures, right? So you show up with a headache and leave with a hole in said head. But honestly, the fact that you're leaving at all is surprising, given the time. They didn't have any advanced medical instruments, but they did have sharp ones. This was the first surgical procedure, it was around 6,500 BC. The term trepanation comes from the Greek term trepanon, borer to, you know, to drill. Number two, rotting whale body. Okay, not all these are not disgusting. One of the most strange things on display at the Australian National Maritime Museum exhibit has got to be the whale carcass treatment. This is an odd treatment. Now the cure for rheumatism back in the 19th century was to crawl inside of a dead whale's body and uh, yeah, just hang out for a bit. And by a bit, I mean a full 30 hours. After that point, you would definitely be healed for at least 12 months. Yeah, it began in the town of Eden, obviously a whaling town on the southern coast of Australia. Only while this was happening, it was kind of funny, the user's head would be poking out of the whale. Yeah, like the world's worst sleeping bag, all tucked in there, getting better. It all started when an intoxicated man stumbled into a dead whale body, passed out, and then when he woke up, his rheumatism was cured, just like that. Yeah, from pale ales to pale whales. No more achy joints for you, my friend, let's do it. And finally, number one. Egyptian nose job. Plastic surgery is more widespread now than it ever has been before, but it's all because it started a long time ago, especially in the ages of the ancient Egyptians. In the Edwin Smith papyrus, along with the documentation of trauma surgeries, bone fractures, fixes, and all that jazz, this text also shows examples of fixes for nasal injuries, which I gotta kinda seek. I have to seek some of that right now. I think I need to get my nose fixed. Can't breathe a lot. The treatment involved manipulating the nose into the desired position before using wooden splints or lint or swabs, anything really to hold it into place. You know, it's an ancient nose job. It's crazy, right? It's truly wild to think back about how much, you know, these people had shaped our world and lives, especially our medical world today. While so much of the civilization still remains a mystery to us, right? It's crazy how much we still know and how much we still don't know. Kicking off the list at number 10, leave. 
One of the first things you'd want to do if you magically were able to travel back to the Middle Ages is come right back. Yeah, it's not knights in shining armor and drinking unlimited IPAs in a heated cot. It was the Dark Ages. It sucked. More often than not, if you lived through the Middle Ages, you never left your village. Because where would you go? The world is also dark and dangerous. Nothing's built yet. You can't warm up in a coffee shop until your Uber arrives, right? Most travelers just slept outside or under some bushes. Records from that time show that the average person didn't travel in their entire life. The rest of this list should also explain why. Number nine, forget a watch. It's pretty easy to find out what time it is today. You can check your smartphone, you can check your watch, you can check your smart watch. We have everything. We don't even have to adjust the hours anymore during daylight savings. That's how easy it is now. You don't even notice anymore. You're like, why is it all of a sudden? Oh, got it. Apple, so good. Back in the Middle Ages, obviously it was harder to check the time. Minutes didn't even exist yet. Yeah, that was that tripped me out when I was reading this. The day was divided by seven long hours. They used water clocks, sundials, all that jazz, but none of them could really tell time to the minute. That long ago, the idea of a minute wasn't a thing. Christian monks were on a tight schedule for work and prayer, so they were actually the first recorded timekeepers in medieval Europe. Imagine being referred to as a <laughs> recorded timekeeper. What time is it? I'm like, Eight. They're like, yo, he's good. Let's get out of here. This guy's so good. Even so, the length of those hours depends on what time of year it is. Winter and summer months matter. As a Canadian, let me tell you, these dark, cold winters really do suck. It gets dark at like 4 p.m. now. Finish work. I'm like, well, I guess I'm going to bed. I don't know. Number eight, forget a mask. The plague made a mark on humanity in the Middle Ages. Back then, they didn't wear a mask and social distance. When Europeans were hit with the Black Death in 1348, fleas carried by rats were mostly to blame. Around one third of the population was killed and it was easily contracted. One sneeze later and your lungs are filling up with liquid. Life expectancy in the late 14th century was 20 years old because of this thing. There was little to no knowledge about germs or how they were spreading, so you'd be in the middle of a literal plague. There'd be bodies lying everywhere, people were dumping they're doo doo at windows. Be like, oh, good evening, madam. And then you'd inhale and then. Number seven, get married. Love is in the air. In the dark ages, marriage was difficult to do. This was long before divorce lawyers came around to get every last drop of you. It was so easy that if you loved somebody, you would just announce that now you're married. Chris, we're married now. Isn't that crazy? That's how easy it was, boom. No need for a priest, big celebration, paperwork? Who has time for that? Nobody likes that before marriage, of course, was also a no-no. So if somebody just happened to wander into the wrong chamber and caught you doing the dirty, all you'd have to do is lie on the spot and say that you're married and then be like, get out, weirdo. And they're like, ah, crap, they're married. We'll try again later. But more often than not, witnesses would be asked to be present when this marriage happened because the sad reality is that guys would often go through all this, get in bed, do the and then deny ever agreeing to the union in the next town when he's shacking up with somebody else. Horrible. Number six disturb the peace. When the Toronto Raptors won the NBA championships here, the place looked like Gotham City. Buses were flipped, there was garbage everywhere, people went nuts. Well, it's a good thing basketball wasn't around back in the Middle Ages because if you disturbed the peace in your local town, maybe you got too drunk, maybe an argument got too loud, maybe there was even a scuffle in an alley, an old ha <laughs> one two. These situations that are common today usually end up with a slap on the wrist. They'll just send you in an Uber home or put you in the drunk tank. But do any of those things in the Middle Ages and you were locked up in the center of the town for an entire day. You'd be locked to the pillory while the town threw stuff at you and said horrible things. They would assault you verbally all day long in the sun. And depending how bad you were the night before and which town you upset, your punishment could be 30 minutes, it could be short and sweet, or it could be all day long and brutal. Both of these sound awful with a hangover happening at the same time. Hit that thumbs up and keep the peace. Huh? Number five, steal. While it's next to impossible to prove your marriage to somebody, it was also pretty tough to catch a thief. No alarms, no cameras, it was literally like Assassin's Creed. You would just throw your hood up, grab an apple, hide it, and then sprint into the woods for 30 minutes and be like, yes, I got away safely. The markup for stealing was also pretty insane for the time, but it made sense. If you stole something worth half a mark in Danish controlled parts of England, you would be fined 80 times whatever you stole. So you'd better be a track star. If you're still on that pie, you're like, I gotta go. This is, my family needs this. Each ruler had a different way of dealing with theft, so you may have gotten off lucky sometimes. Not trying to promote stealing here, but I'm talking about a time where people would risk their life to steal a loaf of bread for their family, you know? Not just like pickpocket a blackberry. But again, sometimes depending on where you got caught, you would lose an ear or you would lose a hand for stealing a cranberry. Anything over half a mark often resulted in death as a punishment. So run fast. Number four, blasphemy. 
When the Catholic Church was running the show during the Middle Ages, you better have been part of the God Squad or else you're gonna join them, apparently. Thomas Aquinas wrote about blasphemy in the Middle Ages, saying that if we compare murder and blasphemy as regards to the object of those sins, it is clear that blasphemy, which is a sin committed directly against God, is more grave than murder, which is a sin against one's neighbor. On the other hand, if we compare them in respect of the harm wrought by them, murder is the graver sin, for murder does more harm to one's neighbor than blasphemy does to God. Yeah, that's, the, that's what you gotta deal with if you went back in time. Good, good luck, hope you're religious. If you spoke ill of the church and had beliefs of your own, God forbid, pun intended, that was one of the most wicked crimes to date. If you were charged with blasphemy, your tongue was removed with hot tongs or pliers. Awful. According to the Old Testament, other punishments would include stoning or hanging. All because you just, you said, I don't like him, I don't like that guy that does things. The way he's doing this, I'm hungry and I'm in pain and my family's dead, I don't know. Sorry. Blasphemy was common because you could accidentally do it, unlike stealing, you know? On my way to the studio today, I slipped on some ice, and let me tell you, if I was in the Middle Ages, I would have been charged twice before 9 a.m. Number three, live in the city. Okay, you may grow up wanting to live in the big city, eh? The Big Apple, the city that never sleeps. Whatever, whatever pulls you to the city, it would have been a lot different back then. Living in the city sucked. It was actually preferred to live in the countryside in the middle of nowhere. Like starving was better than this, really. If you were poor in the city, you had a short and nasty life. Cities were often built near rivers, but it didn't take long for said rivers to be full of sewage. Stinky water. I mentioned the plague earlier. Just like today, numbers pop in large cities, so if disease hit the town, it hit the town pretty hard just constantly wiping out these packed crowds over and over. And maybe you're a fan of the nightlife. Maybe you wish you were able to hit up these local medieval taverns, have a ye olde IPA, ale, whatever the hell. It wasn't even that fun. Curfews were strict, and if you were caught outside of that curfew, the odds of your drunk self getting robbed would be pretty high. Also, cities had public bathhouses too, which sounds nice, but again, during the Black Death, maybe let's not take a dip today. Let's, let's just wait. wait, let's just wait a week. Number two, wear stripes. On Wednesdays, we wear pink, but we never wear stripes. Medieval Europe, if you were caught wearing stripes, maybe you're trying to make a fashion statement, you could literally end up dead. There isn't a gang of mimes that will silently take you out if you wear their colors. No, stripes in medieval Europe was seen as the devil's clothing. There are accounts of real people getting arrested for wearing stripes. That's it. Where and when this began, it's hard to pinpoint, but in 1310, in the French town of Rouen, a cobbler was sentenced to death because he decided to wear stripes that day. It was a big deal though. It wasn't a law that changed depending on what town you're in. It was bigger than that. In 1295, Pope Bonifaci VIII banned religious orders from wearing any type of striped clothing. So it wasn't like, oh, this town's cool. We can wear stripes here. It's like, no, you're the devil. Bye. And finally, number one. Witchcraft. Whenever we think back to the Middle Ages, it's hard to forget that we once would accuse others of being a witch. It's like five plus five, I think that's 10. We're like, how did you know that? You're a witch, you're definitely a witch. They would accuse animals of witchcraft and mm, wizardry. No better sous chef than a golden retriever. Just mix it up some potions. To be fair, Airbud played like nine different sports, so I don't completely disagree on that thought. But cats? What's a cat doing? with a cauldron. On the official list of victims from the Salem witch trials, two cats were accused as well as two dogs. If their pet was behaving strangely, it must mean that they're working with witches in the middle of the night. Nothing to do with the poison rye, just all over the floor. It's for sure part-time witch. Villagers believe that witches traveled at night, not by broom, but by riding on the back of your furry friend. And it also wasn't just dogs or cats. They thought witches rode pigs, wolves, dogs, even turtles. Imagine a witch riding a turtle. I'd be like, I'm good, I'll beat you there. Even so, if you were convicted of being a witch, you had to confess. If you confessed to being a witch, your life was spared, and, and oddly enough, if you refused to confess, then you were executed. In the meantime though, being a witch and all, your head was being dunked in water, you were sleep deprived, these horrible torture methods were used until you were so broken that eventually you just admit to being a witch. You're like, fine, I, me and Airbud, we witch it up, happy, and then, you're fine. If you were suspected of witchcraft, you also had to get naked in front of all these creeps while they looked for the devil's mark. The devil's mark being a birthmark or a mole or freckle, blemish on the skin, whatever. All signs of making deals with the devil, apparently. This thing would have, I would have gone to jail for sure for this one. I would have been dead for this, that's huge. Kicking off the list at number 10, farting around. In the earliest accounts of the fool, going back to the 11th century, these fools were hired to liven up the party. Most of you may have an image of a jester in your head, and right now they're jumping around on tables, telling jokes, doing, doing this shit. It's pretty accurate. It was one of the best jobs to have, this title of a minstrel or a 
Fool. It was an honor to have, really. The Fool's payment was anything but a joke. Roland Le Petoir was rewarded with 30 acres of land from King Henry II as long as he showed up to court every year on Christmas Day to fart. To fart, to literally he would whistle, jump around, and fart. Imagine eating beans on Christmas Day, having a nice time with your family, and then Roland jumps on the table and starts farting all in and around your beans. <laughs> so gross. And then he leapfrogs over your head and then goes and heckles your aunts and uncles. I'd be upset. Christmas Day? What are you doing, man? I'm trying to eat beans. Roland the Farter was his nickname. How great is that? He would also whistle tunes in your face. Air would just come out of this guy from every hole. That's impressive. Number nine. Expert jugglers. I can't watch circus performers do anything. It makes me way too anxious. Seeing somebody like losing balance 50 feet above a crowd, they're like, oh, oh, my toes curl, I can't look. While some think of jesters as nothing but these drunk class clowns who would walk silly and talk sillier, they did some crazy stuff. Juggling was introduced early in the Fool's game, but like Romans getting bored of gladiators fighting, juggling just wasn't enough anymore. They had to raise the stakes. So jugglers began throwing swords, daggers, battle axes. Anything you don't want above your head, jesters would juggle it in front of you while you're eating beans. While some can't watch juggling, others surely can't take their eyes off of it. This was used as an advantage in battle, believe it or not. Jesters would juggle knives, swords, whatever they could, but while they were doing it, they would talk smack to the kingdom's enemies. They would insult their enemy, basically roast them so hard that they break formation and would try and fight the jester at once. You're gonna fight Leapfrog Larry, who's juggling six swords at the same time? Good luck. They would literally chirp them until they left formation, and then at that time, the jester's like, go, I got him. Number eight. Key delivery. Being a professional comedian is hard work. You could say a thousand hilarious, well thought out bits, but one ill-timed tweet that goes a little too far can ruin your entire career, apparently. Well, back in the day, being a professional fool was no different. You needed to find the balance of humor and wit, and it was harder back then, if anything, than it is now. Most of these jesters were given role of advisor to the king and queen. That's what makes them so important in history. The phrase, don't shoot the messenger, yeah, this is kind of where it comes from. The jester would have to tell them bad news but in a positive way. For example, back in 1340, King Philip IV, his fleet was destroyed in a naval battle. The British just absolutely wiped them out. It was an otherwise devastating loss, but the jester brought this news in a positive way. He gave it a positive spin, rather. He said to the king, they didn't even have the guts to jump in the water like our brave French. Where if that was some random dude, his knees would be shaking. He has to tell the king all this horrible stuff, and he's not used to that. Jesters are used to farting on the king's lap. They're the ones to advise for sure. They're definitely the most comfortable with speaking ill truths. Number seven, bad news. Most of the time, jesters knew their way with words. They were royalty. They were smart, despite what their names make you believe. But sometimes the message couldn't be said with a grin or a pun. Sometimes the king would send these court jesters into battle first to deliver that first message. So no matter what the message was, this jester had to go and deliver it in his jester way. That was the whole point. They would tell a clown to be like, hey, go and tell them that we're going to fight. And he'd be like, okay. Jesters were a treat, but they were also quite disposable, sadly. Sometimes the jester would kick off the entire battle, demanding the opposing side to retreat while roasting them at the same time. It was amazing. It makes sense though, what better way to start a battle? A jester runs across the battlefield. He's like, hey, the king said he doesn't want it anymore. He doesn't want the kingdom. You can have it. We're not even gonna fight. It's all good, it's all yours. Uh, apparently the queen has something called ligma. <coughs> Number six, don't quit your day job. The life of a fool was fun and games, but certainly not all the time. They didn't party all day every day, okay? They weren't the group LMFAO. They had to sleep, they had duties to do. They performed the odd time, but on their off days when they're not juggling knives in front of children, they would tend to household duties, much more daunting than roasting the king in front of his family. They would be assigned to keeper of the hounds. Their hands were quite full during this clown downtime. They would have to travel to markets constantly to purchase livestock for the royal family. They fed the family and then entertained them, a true class act. On top of that, when it came to battle, jesters were the ones to hype up the army the night before. They would play music, tell stories, anything to boost morale. When it came to being on the actual battlefield heading towards battles, jesters would also ride across the front of their army, talking smack about the enemy, you know, still trying to hype them up, even on the day. Number five, business casual. Let's get one thing out of the way. Jesters did not dress like this all of the time. That would be amazing, but let's get real, that would be quite itchy. I don't know, all those tights. 
can't wash your stuff back in the day. I don't know, I didn't want to get into it. Handling the hounds while wearing jingle bells also, you'd be a walking, talking chew toy. Bad idea. They dressed like normal people, of course. Well, rather, they dressed like their masters did. They were hired as businessmen who spoke with purpose, and then when the time came, they would lean into whatever skill they brought to the table, be it juggling, singing, playing music, whatever. Now, the attire of a jester is what we recognize the most. Their fit was pretty unreal. Their outfit was bright, usually to get attention, but jesters also wanted to dress as comedically as they could. They wore colors that didn't match well together. They wore odd layers overlapping each other, just flaps of jesterness coming off. It grabbed your eye mid-stew. Their headgear was also quite fun. The ears were supposed to be the ears of a donkey. The ears of an ass, rather. With bells, of course, because, you know, they're fun. Number four, all around the world. Contrary to popular belief, the origins of a court jester did not begin with medieval castles or anything in the English days. They were around long before then. In ancient Rome, there were four types of jesters. There were Sanio jesters, who were pretty much mimes. They would make crazy facial expressions, their physicality was on point, they didn't wear masks or say words. Stupidest clowns, great name, did wear masks. They were the full on clown package. All the ruffles, the hidden face, tall silly hats, big bellies, really creepy, terrifying. I don't like clowns. They would use their riddles to entertain. They would use their words while the other guys just used their bodies. The Scourge jesters were picked solely on their appearance. See, ancient Romans weren't as inclusive or well-mannered when it came to people looking different or having disabilities, so sadly they were hired on their oddities, to say the least. The fourth kind was moriones, is where we got the word moron from. They were the closest thing to our English jester that we have now. They would roast everybody, have a silly walk, a funny talk, and during the festival of Saturnalia, the shortest day of the year, these morons would be the lord of misrule. They would rule the day and tell everyone what to do. It was often a pretty silly time. Imagine an improv teacher doubling down as a dean for the day. Now you get it. Number three not a trickster. Tricksters, clown, and jesters are commonly mixed up, and honestly, it's, that's totally fair. One has a nose that goes bonk, the other dances with jingle bells, and the other plays tricks. It's pretty much the same to us now in our modern days, but tricksters have an entirely different origin than jesters. Jesters came from ancient Roman times. Tricksters from Norse mythology. Hermes, for example, in history, he was considered a trickster of his time. He was the messenger of the gods who also just happened to invent lying. Not, uh, not a good combo. So not only do they go against the rules of their kingdom, but they also go against our laws of physics for the most part. And this has us intrigued still to this day. We're bringing Loki, the trickster, to life. He's fighting the Avengers. He's on Loki season two on Disney+. Plus. It's still going. But back in Norse mythology, Loki was a shapeshifter who supposedly gave birth to Odin's horse. Must have hurt. Over time, the role of a trickster changed, and a lot of these fairy tales, we have trickster characters like Ruffle Stillskin, who'll, you know, pop out of a bush and then make Shrek sign away the day he got married. They screw things up, more or less. That's the trickster. Number two. Jane Fool, one of the few female jesters in history. Here we go. We know about jesters enough now where we can move on to specific people from history. Like Jane Fool, for example. She was included in a royal family portrait. That's a big deal. She's in the background peeking through a doorway. That's pretty creepy, funny, and also pretty epic. She was never trained to be a jester per se, but she was born with the right idea of how to entertain. She was born a comic. She would say what was on her mind. She loved reminding the court that all men were fools before God. She liked to level people, bring them down off their, you know, throne. She would say shit like that, you know, she was great. She was close to King Henry VIII's wives, Anne Boleyn and Catherine Parr, and rumor has it, she was besties with Queen Mary the first. The only person dressed as well as the queen back then was Jane Fool. And finally, number one, Stanchik. One of the saddest paintings of all time, that of the sad clown, Stanchik. The court jester was working under the command of Sigismund the Old in the early 1500s. Now he was one of the most famous jesters in Poland. He was employed by three different kings, quite a big deal. So he never lost steam over time, but something did happen. He was considered one of the wisest, and one tale from his time has stuck with many historians. He was often upset with the king, specifically when Sigismund brought in a giant bear from Lithuania and then released it into the wild to later hunt. Sounds like a fun game, I guess. Or, you know, play Guess Who, that works as well. But what happened was the bear ended up hunting the king and even took his queen off of her high horse. Literally, she fell off her horse, was attacked. It was kind of brutal, I don't want to talk about it. Stanchik straight up ran away after this point. He jingled into the night and then everybody talked about him. How could he? He just left. I could have never. <gasps> He ended up defending his actions by saying it's a greater folly to let out a bear that was already locked in a cage. 
with a roast. A little roast and run. This painting shows the sad jester sitting next to news that the Splensk has fallen to the Russians. The life of a clown is nothing but sadness, apparently. What a good note to end on. Number 10, pressure to perform. In the Middle Ages, either partner in a marriage was entitled to coitus with their partners under any circumstances. It was called the marriage rite. This went both ways, and unless you were passionately in love with your partner and straight, this could be a nightmare. It was so sacred, you could even get it on in a church, and the priest would be like, yep, go for it. Failure to perform in the bedroom or anywhere was grounds for divorce, which was a huge deal at the time. Now, the first problem here is a lack of consent, but the biggest problem for men who weren't inclined to sleep with their wives was impotency. There was no sympathy for men in these circumstances. If a wife accused her husband of this, then the couple would have to undergo a bedroom trial, where a crowd of wise elders, mainly grandmothers, aunts, and mothers, would watch the couple in their bedroom for three nights. If you were rich, this was even worse. These trials would be carried out in public in court. Yeah, that's right. The wife had to prove that the husband couldn't get it up in court. Now, he could call on women of the night to prove his prowess if he was so inclined, but if it was proven that he couldn't, then the couple would be divorced. But the bottom line, the main point of marriage was to have children, and if there weren't any, then this failure was placed heavily on the man. Number nine, beastly justice. I figured I would put a lighthearted one on this list. This actually made me laugh while I was researching it. Beastly justice was when animals had to go to court. They were also put on trial, like a full trial. It's wild to look back at a night and the things they had to do for their kings and queens, but the fact that they also had to get up early and like attend these courts, royal courts, where a wild animal was taking the stand and it actually happened in history. This would happen after an animal runs through town. It would attack people, being confused and all, as most animals are, but the townsfolk would actually believe that the devil was involved in this animal's scheme. Like these animals worked for Big Red himself. In 1457, villagers in France had to deal with six pigs who ran wild and attacked locals. They did a lot of damage, so instead of just putting the animals down or setting them free, you know, away from your town, they took them to a real trial. There was a judge, a couple prosecutors, eight witnesses, a defense attorney for the pigs, which I gotta say, we should do a list just on that person alone. What a weird job. These pigs were hung from a gallows tree. A knight had to formally hang pigs after a trial was concluded. The 1400s were a wild time. Uh, Your Honor, due to my client being a pig, um... Number eight, a tanner. Even for a medieval peasant who never washed or clean themselves and literally lived in filth, this was a dirty job. Women were more commonly found in household chores or as milkmaids, barmaids, weavers, artisans, and tenant farmers. This job may have fallen mostly to men, and it was a rough one. I'll tell you. Men would rather go to war than do this job. You had to get skins from a butcher, along with the grime that covered it, which was mostly manure and blood. Then you had to trim the skins and get rid of all the hair. To do this, they had to let the hair follicles rot by sprinkling it with urine or soak it in a wood, ash, and lime solution. Can you tell which one was cheaper? Then they'd scrape off the hair and any skin before washing it again in pigeon droppings or dog poo to remove the lime and make it softer and more flexible. You. Or the craftsmen might use fermented barley or rye with stale beer or urine, again, as an additive. This could take up to three months. Three months plus longer as there was more rinsing and stretching until it could be used. Leather was a crucial resource, so though dirty, it was a really necessary job, but oh my god. No thank you. Number seven, being a knight. Being a knight, obviously it sounds cool. They have the sword, they have the horse, the flowing hair. They're saving the damsel in distress, all that jazz that you picture in your head. It actually sucked being a knight, a lot. First of all, chain mail. You know how heavy chain mail is alone? It's like 55 pounds, and that was underneath all of your armor. No way I could climb up on a horse wearing armor or chain mail. My knees would buckle, no thank you. Being a knight is something that starts when you're seven years old as well. You would be given to a noble to learn for seven years, and then at age 14, you would become a squire. A knight's intern, not an ideal job to have when you're 14, but okay. But if you stick it out for just seven more years, then you become a knight. And then you can get your chest blown off jousting. Neat. All that time just to get rocked by another bigger dude on a bigger horse. No, just no for me. Number six, 
death by anything but mostly violence. Life in medieval times was considered basically brutal and short. If it wasn't the plague, it was a cold. If it wasn't disease, it was the weather. If it wasn't the weather, it was famine. If it wasn't famine, it was violence everywhere else. It was a damn miracle if you survived childhood. If you had to pick any other time in history to live, like you couldn't live in this one, Taylor asked me this earlier and I had a response, but it definitely wasn't this time. Literally block this time period from your mind. Between 1330 to 1479, men could expect to die nine years sooner than their female counterparts. The reason was violence against men by other men. But the biggest factor that made especially men's lives so short was the violence, as I mentioned. Think about it. It was men who were often called to war with only their farming tools, or if they were proper soldiers, they would have had more. But they were called off to do jobs that literally required them to kill or be killed. Homicide levels in medieval England were around 10 times higher than they are today. This isn't to say at all that women were excluded from this, they were mostly the victims of this violence, but there was a culture around men that expected them to take part in violence to the extreme. From drunken brawls, to duels, to playful sword fights gone wrong, torment, there was a lot going on. Male gangs were responsible for most of the mayhem as they were bolstered with the need to prove themselves. But also, if you were about to get mugged in an alleyway and somebody wanted to fight you, which was very likely because everyone was on edge, it was good to have backup. Number five, rat catcher. As the name hints towards, rat catchers are one of the worst jobs you can have in and around a castle. It's an important role, of course, like being a fool or a literal walking, talking toilet, which I'll get into later, but there needs to be a chasseur de rats. Chasseur de rats, I'm just gonna start calling myself that. Back in those times, rats and mice were the leading source of spreading disease. They didn't have city buses or you know, people walking around throwing bottles. And with these castles being big and dark, they were probably full of rats. Black rats were a common household problem, yuck. So in comes the well-respected rat catcher. These guys would sometimes try and use spells to get rid of rats. Wouldn't work really too well, but more often than not, that didn't work, so poison powders were the main trick of the trade. The most famous you probably heard of is the Pied Piper. He visited Germany, he arrived in the small town, and rumor has it this guy used a flute to drive all the rats just into the river. He just, hmm. He does a musical performance and then exterminates all of your pests. If anything, he should be getting a bonus, but rather the town insists they weren't even gonna pay him, so he used his flute to make everybody just go away and leave the town forever. What an OG. He's like, you don't wanna pay me? No sweat. <gasps> Number four, the Crusades. Just imagine this, thick, heavy metal armor reflecting the heat from the sun back against you as you chug along the desert. Despite being in the holy land, this certainly sounds like hell. As I mentioned earlier, men were expected to go to war when called, even if they had no training or skill and like maybe knew how to use a toothpick but had no idea what a sword was. For many, it was a death sentence and the first crusades were particularly brutal um, because you weren't only being called to war because of, you know, honor, but you were being called to war because it was a religious thing. Getting there was awful in the first place, you might not even make the voyage. Then marches through the desert were long and hot with soldiers constantly at odds with starvation, dehydration, disease, infection, the elements, and then of course, a spontaneous attack from the enemy. So like you're exhausted and all of a sudden you have to be like, <sighs> fighting somebody to save your life. There are even stories of some of them boiling shoe leather to eat it because they had nothing else. And after what we know of tanning, ugh. many crusaders justified their suffering as a part of the spiritual journey. So if you did fall ill to disease, you were just kind of left by the side of the road to die alone. Number three, groom of the stool. Nowadays, assistants grab your coffee for you, maybe they answer some phone calls, keep the business running while you're off doing your other business stuff. Assistants are vital. The groom of the stool was quite vital when it came to the king. Created by King Henry VIII, the role was to assist the king's bowel movements. Yeah, you had just a box with you that you carried at all times, little opening lid, smelled horrible, and you would literally follow the king until he needed to use you. Yeah, porta potties weren't a thing, and there's no way you're going to catch a king shitting in the woods. In fact, you won't even catch a king wiping his own behind. That was also reserved for the groom of the stool. Lucky you. In this stool, you would have water, towels, a wash bowl, the whole setup. And you're probably thinking, Taylor, which poor soul had to be stuck with this role? What must you have done to deserve such a punishment? Well, this is the job you wanted, really. Only sons of noblemen could take on this role, and in doing so, they also gain access to every room, tons of nice clothes, any bedchamber furnishings, and of course, a high pay, yeah. I would say this is the 
easiest job on this list, but it's really not. Number two, the executioner. A man named Franz Schmidt meticulously chronicled his life as an executioner in detail. And well, as you can guess, it's not it's not a fun one, but there was a lot of humanity behind it too. He had to start practicing on pumpkins at first, then graduate to live animals, and then humans. Who would choose a role like this? Well, though legally the role wasn't hereditary, it pretty much was by expectation and blood. The job was passed from eldest son to eldest son with other sons being trained to fill vacancies. Daughters of executioners married sons of executioners so the position would continue. As most people saw this as a pretty undesirable profession, it was difficult to keep anyone at their post, so the job fell to the men who inherited the axe as it were. So. Not legally, but it was. This cycle of executioners created something called executioner dynasties across Europe. The existence of these dynasties meant that men were trapped in this cycle of employment and had few other opportunities to work. It also meant you had a very lonely life, as people who associated with death weren't people anyone liked to hang around. And number one, the gong farmer. The Gong Farmer, of course we had to end on this one as it's definitely the most crappy of the list. Medieval washrooms are just horrible, they're not really a thing, they didn't have the sanitation techniques that we have today. Stuff would often pile up within the castle walls and over time it would smell worse and worse. You can only imagine. The Rat Trapper would be around this area too, I'm assuming, so maybe they would see each other and fist bump and be like, hey our jobs suck, nice, let's do it, get that bread. So these respected gong farmers, they would come in and take the bad stuff away from the castle. They were crap commuters, essentially. These cesspits were usually in the bottom of the castle, the lowest level, because you know how gravity and things work. These guys would go in and dig through years of yuck, piles of it, just moving all day long back and forth out of the castle. They too were paid well, really well obviously, but a lot of these gong farmers got sick. A good number of them just wouldn't come out of those pits. Pretty horrible, right? And on top of that, people didn't like talking to them. Their job wasn't cool like the guy who takes heads. Head and shoulders also didn't exist back then. They didn't smell the best. They were often just kind of, eh, and they crossed the street. It was sad, it was all bad. Hashtag all bad. Number 10, farming. In a world with a lack of food, not because I ate it all, which is honestly a good reason, peasantry had to work on their farms, not only to feed the rich, but also themselves. So if the men in your household are ill or sick, then that means it's rivet rosy time, or farming fran time, whatever you want to call it. I don't need to tell any farmer out there how tough their job can be. Being a medieval woman farmer, that's tough. Also, they probably weren't allowed to wear clothing that was more suitable for plowing fields. And of course, there's a woman trying to do a man's job. How dare she? People just should have let them be. There's a good chance the crops wouldn't make it either. A green thumb would have come in very handy. A tough job nonetheless. Number 9. Beer Maiden This one goes out to any woman who's ever had the pleasure of working at a certain restaurant that's fixated on women's chests. You know the one I'm talking about. Or any woman who had the absolute pleasure of working at a golf course clubhouse. Keep your mitts to yourself, you filthy animals. I can't imagine the bar maidens of yieldy times had better luck. There really aren't a lot of laws to protect them either, but basically they helped serve ale in the taverns and inns, which brought in all kinds of unsavory types. Mind you, it's not as bad as it would be in Skyrim or you know other fantasy RPGs, but it's still a sour bunch. Sometimes there were just barrels of ale and the maiden's job was to simply just keep filling the tankards and handing them out. I'm sure she was well respected and not even once ever had her personal space infringed upon, right? Of course not, no. Number eight, caring for children. Hey, someone had to do it. A woman's job is never done. At least that's what my mom, my aunt, uh, my grandma, and pretty much every woman I've ever known has always said. Okay, sure, I was a little bit of a handful. I was loud and energetic and, and I loved to talk. Teachers always said I was a distraction in class. All right, maybe I was, and maybe I still am. Okay, I am. But at least the women caring for me had the modern amenities of the 21st century. A fridge full of fresh food, washing machines, cars, and a solid structure with four walls. So you can imagine if you had to deal with a kid like me back in ye olde times, just with none of the nice stuff that makes life today a lot of fun. Ye olde Chetty running amok. Oh, mother, mother. Number seven, the streets. Unusual to most, but very common to women of yieldy times. When you're a woman who's got nothing, sometimes you gotta give something. That something just so happens to be what's hiding in your pants. It's a profession that's as old as time, and it will not be going anywhere anytime soon. 
Women work the streets. I don't think that's anything to be ashamed of. Number six, Joan of Arc. It doesn't get more unusual than the savior of France. England and France were having a go at it, if you will. Which, if you know, history was like round 12 of 100. Anyway, it wasn't going too well for France. It was going rather poor, actually. The same kind of poor I got on my report cards under the paying attention section. Oops. Then there was Joan, really a, a nobody, when one day she heard the voice from a higher power that she was to drive the English out of France. Naturally, the people around her, especially the men, scoffed at the thought of a young woman being the hero they needed. But given that they had nothing to lose, suited her up and sent her out. Plot twist, she did very well, like crazy good. The Battle of Orléans proving her grit. The English were so confused and disgruntled by a young peasant girl defeating their armies, they thought it was only proof of one thing, that she wasn't a sign of God, but rather a sign of the devil. How dare a woman beat us in co That's man stuff. You can't do that. Number five, queen. It is unusual. Most people didn't get to be royal. I mean, think about it, seriously. Although I'd certainly like to be. I can't just imagine it. King of the internet. King of the black hoodie, nice. Or king of the Chinese buffet. My point is that while women in medieval times didn't get the respect that they deserve, and every girl does, queens just had it better, and that's unusual. The queen might not have been as well respected as the king, but compared to the peasantry, she was fed. Had four walls around her that didn't leak or wind would you know, seep through or blow down, and wasn't working herself to the grave every day to provide for a king and queen that didn't think very much about them. That's a really hard life to live. Number four, cooking. Chief, somebody had to do it. Although, there's something that tells me the food wasn't that good. This isn't exactly Gordon Ramsay's five-star cuisine. Beans, cabbage, eggs, onions, bread, and of course, beer or ale to wash it down. The peasantry just didn't have the same access to food like royalty did. Although with a list like that, it sounds like it's a fast track way to an upset stomach or some really grody gas, dude. It was women who would often be preparing those delicious dishes. Besides the hours I would spend on the commode after visiting a commoner's house from eating that, the taste is something we're talking about, I think. When you guys are cooking chicken, for example, what are your favorite recipes, spices, flavors? Let us know in the comments, I'm curious. My favorite chicken is barbecue chicken, brushed with a little Diana sauce. Medieval folks just didn't have that. More upsetting than that is the lack of spices in general. While there were some, anything not local would have been crazy expensive and not available to common folks. Medieval women did the best with what they could when they had it. That's just how it goes, Chief. I talked to him, he's a chef, he said it's all right. Number three, nuns. It makes sense, honestly, becoming a woman of God was honestly a good career choice for a woman. For starters, you become a woman of God and that means you're protected under his vision. Thank you, Jeebus. And people need that back then, seriously. Secondly, it would also give you a place to live. Some nuns stayed in one town and others traveled where needed, staying in monasteries and convents where it was possible, and probably more comfortable than living in the mud and stone huts that the serf women were living in. And lastly, they got rulers and sticks, and if someone was bad, they would punish them when they misbehave. Oh, sorry sister, I didn't mean to say naughty words in the classroom. I guess you'll have to spank Chetty now, ooh. All jokes aside, this might have been one of the best things for a woman to be, besides royalty or marrying rich. It's just how the times went. Number two, landowner. I was shocked by this one too, honestly, but yes, women could own land. Sort of. It wasn't a blanket green light. It's a bit more confusing than that. Some could, some couldn't. There was a few rules here and there. They were stupid man patriarch poo poo rules, but rules nonetheless. In Normandy, for example, only men and their sons could possess land ownership. In the Basque region, both sons and daughters could inherit land. In England, both could, but if there were any surviving men or brothers, then they would be considered first, and not women at all sometimes. So, no, it's not as open as today, and you probably would catch some strange looks as a woman rolling up to an empty lot and staking your shovel in the ground. It makes life a lot easier if there aren't so many rules, and I know you guys agree with me at home. The less red tape, the better, right? And be nice to girls, be nice to women. Number one, artists. This one hits home. I think Chris can agree with me on this one. A lot of male artists, writers, and poets get remembered from history, but there was a few decent female ones too. We gotta give them some spotlight. Just, it sucks that males get all the spotlight. To me, this makes sense. In my experience, a lot of girls I knew growing up had natural talent for arts. I remember growing up in school and art class was always one of my worst subjects. No, not because I didn't follow directions, but my art never came out the way I wanted it to. I, I didn't feel the motivation, babe. I, didn't, I couldn't see the motivation. Most of the girls in art class just passed with flying colors. 
no pun intended, and for writing, well, besides my dyslexia, if you looked at a paper I wrote in the sixth grade versus a girl from my classroom in the sixth grade, what's the difference? Well, you can actually read hers. I, mine are terrible. All grade school antics aside, notable artists and writers include Clerica, Gouda, that's a cool name, and Hildegard of Bingen. Names you might not know, but for sure are worth a Google search. Number 10, property. It should be no surprise to anyone watching this today, but women's rights and the treatment of women was not everyone's priority in the medieval ages. Dudes were just mean, I'm sorry. Where did it all stem from? I'm not sure, I'm just a guy with blue eyes, and sometimes I say funny stuff. But what I do know is that women were treated more like men's property, which is, that's, that's, that sucks, that's gross, no one likes that. Which they are not, thank you very much. Sometimes women were traded, like currency for livestock animals, land, and just business dealings in general, because women didn't have a say in the matter. Like, I'll give you two goats for my daughter, here you go, dude, which is just, that's not a fair deal, dude. That's that's not a trade, man. Not a trade. Number nine, promising young woman. Remember when I said if I talk about medieval times, I was gonna bring this up? It's a classic, a medieval staple. Couldn't couldn't talk about medieval times without it, really. What am I getting at? Well, that's marrying a woman in her midlife, about about 12 years old. Yeah, I know. It's gross. Deplorable, despicable, naughty, and just unsavory. Okay, so people only lived to their mid-30s and 40s back then, so time is of the essence. Sure, I get it, but come on, man. I am hereby banning any cradle robbing or diaper sniping. That includes the dudes who out of high school and they're dating a woman still in high school. I'm banning it. That's it. Chetty says no. Number eight, bedroom watch party. Okay, let me paint the scene for you. It's 2009, you just finished pre-drinking and watching the latest episode of Jersey Shore with your friends. There's enough hair product in your hair to keep a bowl of lime jello still. You slap on some Uggs and head to the club. You meet someone who's cute AF. Maybe it's the tequila, maybe it's the apple bottom jeans, but you wanna come home with this person. Instead of making it to your bedroom, a bathroom nightclub is now your domain for love. People walk by and witness your actions but you do not care because this is your life and it's 2009 and you can do whatever you want. Okay, so that, but medieval times. Yeah, it's not a nightclub, but people would just come into your bedroom to witness that you went through with it on the marriage. Nobody wants that. That's just weird, that's not normal. Come on in, me and my wife are about to, come on in. Number seven. The Hunger Games. In the not so common case of a woman trying to divorce her husband, because you know, she's most likely not being treated very well and she's just not allowed to divorce and it's really just a messy time for women. How do you lose a woman? You forget to cherish her. Or you fight in combat to determine who wins the divorce. And by winning the divorce, I mean whoever wins lives, yes. This was something that was actually done in medieval Germany. Basically, there's a little arena. Husband gets put into a hole to make it air, I guess. There's a sack of rocks and a club, and then you just full send it and start swinging at each other. I feel like most divorces suck. Not that I would know, I've never been married, but I mean, come on, are the married people really telling me at home right now that they wanna swing rocks and clubs at each other? <laughs> I don't think so. Number six, gross. Kangas Khan, maybe the most down bad dude to ever get on a horse and do what he did. Well, maybe except Arthur Morgan, but he's not real, even though I wish that chiseled, handsome, rugged man was. <sighs> Despite my daydreaming fantasies, I'm here to talk about a really bad dude, Kangas Khan, medieval conqueror and womanizer. He had so many wives, who a good portion of which were forced at sword point to be his wife, and husband and wives were not exactly sitting around the couch uh, watching news together back then. They, they did the deed, whether or not both partners signed off on it. What I'm getting at is he had so many offspring that his DNA is still with us today. 0.5% of the male population on Earth are descendants of the Mongol warrior. That's over 60 million dudes. That's just insane, bro. Number five, the Moss. I ain't gonna come in here and tell you I know what it's like to be a woman or pretend I understand. There's been lots of great photos of humans that have been taken throughout history, but one that we miss for sure is when I was a kid and I learned what happens to women on those special couple days of every month. Not shock, just confusion. The look on my face, it was it was priceless. I wish I wish y'all could have seen it. We got things mostly figured out now though, but think about the past. Medieval times, not an understanding time for ladies. There were just no products to help in that scenario. So, have you ever wondered what they did? I did, weird thing to think I guess, but oh well. Moss pads, yeah. Take some moss, you wrap it up in a cloth, bada bing, bada boom. 
not your business. Which actually is really smart when you think about it. I never would have thought of that, but that's, I'm a dude, so I, would, I wouldn't think about that. I just don't, I don't, you know, I don't, I don't think about those big thinking thoughts and things sometimes. I'm just a big dumb guy. Number four, witch hunt. This is also a time where if a woman speaks out of line or does something to upset the feng shui of things, there's a good chance she will get labeled a witch and burned at the stake. This was becoming an issue because, well, it was becoming a witch hunt, meaning anything that was slightly not cool or basically anything people feared or disliked could be labeled witchcraft. And thus likely an innocent woman would be burned at the stake. I mean, it sounds like they had it down to a science, really. Woman does something crazy, will bring out the charcoal briquettes. No, no. see, that's, that's not right. It's not like they could have done this amazing thing called investigate. You know, see if the woman was actually innocent or the claims that she was a witch because she wants to be paid a fair wage like a man. Mm, that doesn't really sound like witchcraft to me. Maybe don't be so hasty to bust out the pitch and torches. That's all. That's all I'm saying. Number three, you gotta do what you gotta do. I know what it's like to be down on your luck. Trust me, it sucks. It's not fun. But you budget, save, and work hard. You'll be back in the black before you know it. Women of medieval times got up and went to work. The kind of work a lot of women were forced to do because of circumstances. The oldest profession in the book, selling booty. It's been happening since day one and it won't be going anywhere soon. Now, I'm not here to condemn that kind of work. And funny enough, in medieval times, it was considered to be an actual profession. I just feel if you're gonna be in that line of work, it should be your choice. I'm a Las Vegas kind of guy. I love gambling, boozing, and the freedom to do what you want after strolling out of a casino after too much drinking and gambling. If you know what I mean. Sometimes you gotta do what you gotta do to make the bread and they just had to do what they had to do. And that's it. Number two, Hell Hath No Fury. Princess Olga of Kiev was a prime example of Hell Hath No Fury like a woman scorned. Long story short, her husband was torn apart by trees. Some gruesome stuff. It was actually, if you're looking, it's, it's, not, it's not nice. So like the Sith on its worst behavior, she plotted her revenge. When 20 men she deemed were all responsible for her husband's passing were coming into town, she had a large ditch dug where they were buried alive. That is that is so heinous, I, I can't even. She then extended a welcome to more of the men responsible. When they arrived, she invited them to wash up in her bathhouse where she had the doors locked and the place torched. Like it was a witch hunt or something, just had them cooked, just threw, just cooked them up, just, but I mean, they, they burn women, so why not? Why not cook some dudes? Uh, okay. Number one, honestly, who throws a shoe? If you've ever been to a wedding, then you've probably seen the bride throw a bouquet of flowers to waiting bridesmaids and other lucky ladies. Because the lady who catches the flowers is the next woman to be swept off her feet and to be married. Put a ring on it. Kind of ending on a wholesome note here, which is kind of nice, but it's still a, a little messed up. Hear me out. In medieval times, it wasn't flowers. It was shoes. At first, it doesn't seem so bad, right? Shoes. We'll throw some shoes around. Why not? Besides, you know, the, the shoe being thrown too hard. You wouldn't want to catch a loafer the side of the head, that, that would hurt. I think we forget how filthy our shoes can be. I mean, they walk through everything, dirt, mud, blood, and if you're in medieval times, having a good old fashioned wedding in the village probably meant some manure. Eesh. Well, I'm all about tradition, but maybe we could throw the flowers instead. They just smell better, and you know, there's just there's less poop. Kicking off the list at number 10, the big city. Okay, it's the 14th century, it's Saturday. You and the boys are off to have a hoot and or holler. You decide to hit the big city, check out one of those medieval taverns that everybody is talking about. So, what should you expect? Should you get your fake ID? Should you have a, your passport? Is there a bouncer? What's covered tonight? How many rupees is covered? Well, for starters, this is a long time before Ubers. So unless you have a horse or two, you're gonna have to walk quite a bit just to get to the bar. If the Black Death didn't get you, the commute into the city definitely would. Your knees would be clicking. Living in the city was horrible. Strict curfews were put into place. Violent crimes would happen all throughout the night because obviously back in those days there's no police force out patrolling. Just shady dudes and hoods. Just Big Ched would be in the corner with his hood up just planning something, you know what I mean? Number nine, house special. Many of these ale brewers were women, probably because men were too busy drinking it. Ale and bread were both necessities when it came to living in the late 12th century, because there's no Taco Bell anywhere. This food's sparse. Hunting, it's all sparse. I like saying the word sparse, it's nice. Sparse. Baking bread was not freely permitted, but making ale in your basement was. Yeah, we went from making ale in our living rooms to banning alcohol. History is wild sometimes. So the higher ups, these noble lords, they wouldn't care if you made ale and had a block party and all that jazz and made all that noise, but if you made weak ale, 
or if it was improperly measured and then distributed, then you would get a fine. Imagine that. That's like the police busting your house party, only when they get there, they turn the music up and congratulate you on a proper barrel of White Claw. Uh, yes, Black Cherry, the finest. Number eight, don't mind the rats. Oh, what's that? You're with your friends and family gathering around a table, eating and drinking and conversing, having a lovely time? Ah, be a shame if hundreds of rats started to swarm your feet while you were mid-bite, wouldn't it? Welcome to the past. The plague rolled into town back in 1328 and it lasted until like 1350. It lasted a long time. It was actually horrible. We think of the plague in history and we're like, man, was that anything like the past few years? No. Not at all. I haven't seen any swarms of rats lately. I haven't gotten the Black Death. The European population was reduced by one third and rats were mostly to blame. Yeah, these quick hairy balls of yuck just scurrying through the town. I don't want any part of that. I don't like rats. I actually do not like rats. These little guys passed it on. Mid meal, you would feel a tickle, look down. Oh, it's just the plague. Nice, just a couple of plagues waiting for crumbs to fall. Oh, how cute is that? Yep, just the bill, thanks. Number seven, BYOF. If you're passing by one of these middle-aged taverns, maybe you feel like grabbing some questionable lunch. Well, you better come prepared, my friend. Bring your own fork, because we don't have any. We can't afford that. We're not blacksmith, we can't make a fork. What's a fork? We didn't have a moody server sitting in booth 11 doing roll-ups all night. This was the middle ages. If you had a fork, you took care of that fork. Forks don't grow on trees, pal. If you were lucky, these establishments would dish out a couple of spoons. Maybe a couple of spoons, but forks? Nice joke, you're getting laughed at. You're watching everybody eat while you starve. Historians compared sharing forks to sharing toothbrushes. So that's, in case you're wondering, no, you're not borrowing a friend's. Oh, after you've done that bike, can I just maybe? No, get out of here, see ya, off with your head. You also didn't have a steak knife handy ever. Knives were only reserved for carvers. Until the 17th century, all you had were little daggers. You would just poke and tear through your meal. You just poke it. Number six, ins and outs. My favorite title. I've worked here for a year and a half now, it's my favorite title. When we think of a medieval tavern or an inn, it's important to note the differences. Yes, there's drinking. Yes, it smells like dad breath all throughout the air. But inns, their sole purpose was to house travelers comfortably. Whereas the tavern, not so much housing, more of rough housing, know what I mean? Taverns were almost a private event thing. Your neighbors would whip up some ale, light a candle, two is a company, three is a crowd, come on in, now we got a basement tavern fight club, let's party. It was that easy, that was a tavern, you now have a tavern. No license, no nothing, just come on in, look what I made, drink it. Number five, license to pour. We got inns, we got taverns, so what else? Where can we get a pint in the 1500s? I am thirsty. Well, come the time of King Henry VII, these establishments were known as pubs. I know, I'm jumping ahead here a little bit, but this is the perfect time to talk about some early pub history. Why not, just squeeze it in. By 1577, there were over 17,000 alehouses, 3,000 inns, 500 taverns, all throughout Old England. So that's one pub for every 200 people. That is so much ale. That's, oh my gosh, do they work here too? This is a lot. So in order for this to take off, an act was passed in 1552. Innkeepers needed a license, so you can no longer throw a sleeping bag down, make some questionable wine in your cellar, and then call it an inn. That's not how it works, That's we're not doing that. We're not going to your basement and sleeping and drinking your ale. It's not gonna fly anymore. Show me some license. <laughs> Show me some licenses. -es. Number four, cherry brandy. Okay, it doesn't matter if you're a noble or a knight or whatever, everybody wants to go to the pub and loosen up. Especially a young Prince Charles. Back in the day, he would often visit the local Stornoway Harbor Village pub. So yeah, you would walk up, sit next to a prince and be like, hi, can I buy you a drink? What's going on here? He would often order from the bartender in a soft voice a cherry brandy. This prince was being discreet, but unfortunately a local reporter just happened to be sipping some crispy cold ones at the same time and overheard this guy getting his whistle wet. So now it was of course a huge scandal. A prince drinking, having fun? Number three, tavern history. Before the middle ages, there were still taverns. Places where alcohol was sold, of course, this goes back thousands of years. Taverns, believe it or not, existed during ancient Roman days. In ancient Greece, the Lesh, which was a fancy club, it served food to its members as well as strangers. So it was the first tavern, essentially. Ancient Greek taverns as well. Imagine making ale in flip-flops and like a little toga, I'd be so, I'd be dancing around, it'd be so light and just, nah, it wouldn't actually be horrible. It sounds like a horrible job. The Code of Hammurabi from ancient Babylonia, so around 1750 BCE, even all the way back then, they had the death penalty in place for those who improperly diluted beer. 
Imagine losing your head because you threw in too many hops. I'm like, ah, uh, oops. Did you see him take a step? He's like, mmm. They're like, oh, please. Number two, drink ale responsibly. The night is beginning to wind down. There's a guy in a piccolo playing closing time in the corner. It's, you know, it's time to hit the road. We're feeling it. Stools are going up. We're, you know, some guy's wiping something off something. How dangerous are these drunken commutes at this point? Well, back in ye olden days, there wasn't a friendly server that made sure you had some water before calling you a cab. No, in the 14th century, ale was three gallons for a penny. Nobody was cutting you off. They're like, yep, keep going. Give us your pennies, sir. Ooh, down your throat. In 1276 in Elstow, a man named Osbert Le Whale came home from a local tavern just extremely intoxicated, not looking good. So much so that he fell and hit his head on one of the many stones around his house and then, well, Bob's your uncle. Yeah, get home safe. If you're gonna drink, do responsibly and get home completely safe. And finally, number one, the ride home. Like I just said, this was a lawless time. People would go to the tavern, slam tons of ale, and then just ride a horse home. Like it was, Fine? Yeah, not a great idea at all. This is drunk driving back in the day. More often than not, these guys would fall off or get lost or pass out on their horse and just end up in a different place. Imagine an unconscious knight strolling through a village at 6 a.m. You're like, that's Eric. That's literally Prince Eric. He's gone. He's asleep. In the early 1300s, it was pretty common for your husband to just not return at all. He would just leave the bar with the lantern, not see the well in front of him, trip, fall in, and drown. Like. You couldn't see anything, this was street lights back then. What a way to go out, horrible. There was one report of a man who was on his way home from the local tavern. He had to go to the washroom, break the seal, classic. So he decided to pull over and then go and relieve himself in the pond. But during so, he fell in and then drowned. Yeah, so back then it was just a bunch of drunk guys walking around uneven roads. So yeah, accidents are bound to happen. Guy's not even intoxicated. He's like, God, this road sucks. Oh,